Our scripture today is Luke chapter 14, verses 28 to 33. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned, to them, turned and said to them, <clears throat> Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost? to see whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. May God bless the reading of his word. Can you hear me? Okay. Let's take a deep breath. <laughs> breathing in and breathing out. Say it one more time. Breathing in and breathing out. All right. Naples, Florida. Many of you know that that was my first setting of ministry once I became ordained, um, where I learned a whole lot of things. I was in my early 30s, and I learned so much while I was there for 13 years about life and ministry and what it means to lead. Um, and there are learnings that I have continued to take with me the last 30 plus years as I have continued to grow in understanding of those things and new ones. And one of those experiences that I had in Naples, Florida that I vividly remember happened when I was visiting a family in an upscale neighborhood because you might know this about Naples, Florida. It's a place where a lot of wealthy people live. And we were sitting out back in the, in the lanai, which is a fancy word for a uh, covered back porch. Uh, so I, we were sitting on the lanai, and I was looking across the, the uh, canal that they were living on at all of the beautiful homes that were across from them. Beautiful, beautiful landscape, big, luxurious homes with one glaring exception. What I saw appeared to be an abandoned, half-built house. And when I asked about it, the couple said, yeah, unfortunately, the owner started the project but didn't plan for how much it was actually going to cost. And he ran out of money, no landscaping, just that half-built house and sandy, weedy mess. And it's been just sitting there for the last few years, an embarrassing disappointment to him and a real eyesore for the rest of us. But as I heard that story, all I could think about was our scripture lesson today from Luke chapter 14. Today we are going to be reflecting on the second habit of highly effective disciples called begin with the end in mind. Will you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, we give you our thanks for this day of worship. This day that we set apart to be reminded of who we are and who you are and who you call us to be as followers of Jesus. And so I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts this morning might be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh God, are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Begin with the end in mind. This, of course, originates from Stephen Covey's best-selling book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which has sold over 40 million copies since its original release in 1989. The book talks about seven habits or practices that you and I can develop in our lives that will make us more effective. Now, notice the word effective. Not successful, not efficient, 
not the best, effective. The seven habits are universal in that they are based upon timeless principles that I believe also have a spiritual dimension to, him, to them, which is why I am including this in the sermon series. Last week, Reverend D. Ope talked about what it means to be proactive, to be prepared so that when difficult circumstances present themselves in your life and in mine, you and I can respond rather than react to them. To be like the wise man that Jesus once spoke about that built his house on rock rather than on the sand. And so today, we're going to be talking about the next habit that builds on that first habit of being proactive called to begin with the end in mind as it relates to our spiritual lives and how building this habit can impact the rest of our lives in a way that makes a huge difference. Now, let me begin by saying that I remember a time in my life as I was just starting college. I was only 17 years old at the time. And I had a great deal of confusion going on in my life at that time about who I was and where I was going. Maybe some of you can relate to that. Um, I had lots of voices from my parents and from my friends and my family members and teachers and church folks saying all kinds of things to me about what I should do and how I should be. But which ones were the right ones for me? What was I being called to? And who was I called to be? I had to decide. Covey says that each of us have three lives. We have a public life. That's the life that we project to the rest of the world. We have a private life, the life that we live with our family members, those that are closest to us, as well as time all by ourselves. And we also have a deep inner life which influences the other two. The problem is that many folks never go deep into their inner life. And the result is what Covey says, in a sense, they are being lived rather than living. They're being lived. They're not living. Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like you're being lived, but you're really not living? I've had that experience where I was trying to meet all of my assumed expectations that other people had of me, whether they were real or not, to the extent that I spent little time going deep into myself to consider what would really give me life, the life that I wanted, and more importantly, the life that God wanted for me. Beginning with the end of mine is about taking that deep dive into the inner life, to discover the principles and the values which lead us in the mission and intention that God has for your life and mine. It's about the cost of building the house or the life that you and I are building as followers of Jesus. Let's look about at how Jesus talks about it in Luke chapter 14. He begins, as you probably heard, with some pretty stark language. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. What? Wait just a minute here. Now, now, does Jesus really call you and me to hate our biological families and even our own lives? No, he doesn't. Now, why do I say that? I say that because I know enough about Jesus' teachings to recognize that he does something um, in his parables and his teachings. It's a rhetorical device called hyperbole. Can we all say that together? Hyperbole. Hyperbole. What is it? Hyperbole is an extravagant exaggeration that's not meant to be taken literally. It's to help direct you to a bigger truth. It would be like saying... Well, this isn't a bigger truth, but sometimes it is. My feet are killing me. Or I love you to the moon and back. Or you fill in the blank. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. There you go. Hyperbole. Hyperbole. 
So when Jesus is saying that you have to hate the people that you would normally be closest to, what he's getting at is pushing us to really think about where you and I place our priority, our primary allegiance as his disciples. Because if anyone or anything is more important than following him, Jesus says you're not following him. The next verse emphasizes the same point about loyalty. Let's look at verse 27. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, we know that Jesus isn't meaning for you and me to walk around with a cross, carrying a cross around our back. No. He's talking about discipleship. Following Jesus is about giving up self-interest and ever-competing loyalties in our lives. Neither of these sayings of Jesus lend themselves to an easy believism or a low-cost form of faith that we often call cheap grace. No, these sayings stress the high cost of following Jesus. And that's where we come to the next part of this teaching is Jesus shares the parable of the landowner. This guy builds a house, a tower, either for storing produce or guarding land or animals. If the landowner, Jesus says, has not estimated how much the tower's going to cost, it's possible that the project will remain unfinished due to lack of funds. And like that guy that I taught you about in Naples who had to quit his building project because he didn't count the cost, the end result will be ridicule from all those who see the unfinished structure. Then in verses 31 and 32, we have the story of the king who assesses the number of troops in light of the greater number that his enemy possesses. And if he can't win with the number of soldiers he has, the only wise course would be for him to negotiate with his enemy long before they ever meet on the battlefield. In both of these stories, Jesus illustrates the necessity of counting the cost of discipleship. In other words, don't start the journey without considering what it means to follow Jesus. Beginning with the end in mind is a habit that asks us to be response-able. Response-able. Able to respond, not just react to life circumstances. With God and with others and with ourselves. By getting in touch with our deep inner life. So how do we do that? How do we actually count the cost of following the way of Jesus with the special mission that all of us are given to love God and others and ourselves more fully? In your bulletin today, there is an insert that I'd like to invite you to take home with you today. So please don't throw it away. Take it home with you um, to do some of that deep inner life work. And I'm going to go through it with you today by telling a story so that you and those who are joining us online this morning will all have the opportunity to engage in that process intentionally. So for those of you who are joining us online today, I invite you to just take a moment to grab a piece of paper and something to write with and take some notes. I'm going to share a story that Covey calls the four prescriptions. And the story goes something like this. There was a person who was going through a period in his life when he was struggling with this feeling of malaise and depression. And so he goes to his doctor, and after describing what goes on, what's going on in his life, the doctor says, I think I know what's wrong, and I'm going to give you four prescriptions for treating it. Now, these four prescriptions can't be filled at a pharmacy, but it is vital for you to follow these prescriptions to the letter. Here's what I need you to do. First, I want you to think about your favorite place, preferably some place that has to do with nature. I want you to go there for a solid day and take a look within yourself. No radio, no TV, no uh, phones, no uh, writing materials, no uh, reading materials. You just go with yourself. And you're going to begin at 9 o'clock in the morning with the first prescription. And then at 12, and then at 3 and then at six. So the man went to the beach, and it was his favorite place. And at 9 a.m., he opened the first prescription, which read, listen 
carefully. Listen carefully. Be silent. Slow down the frenetic pace of your public life and the disenchantment with your private life. Listen. What do you hear when you are quiet and listening? Maybe if it's on the beach, you're hearing the sound of the waves crashing on the shore. Or maybe you hear seagulls. Or maybe if you're listening really, really carefully, you can even hear the sounds of crabs digging in the sand. This prescription was to take three hours to do nothing but listen. And the man did that. And while it was uncomfortable at first, over those three hours, as time went on, he found himself relaxing and enjoying the connection with creation. He felt his spirit become lighter And he almost didn't want to do anything else for the remainder of the day. But at noon, he he took it, literally, he, he took out the second prescription, which said this. Try reaching back. Think about your past. Get into your memory. And so the man began to think, and his mind wandered back to his childhood of times when he and his siblings would run together and play on the beach together. And he smiled as he remembered what life was like when he had less distractions that kept him from truly enjoying life. And he thought about what he might need to let go of in order to make some time, some space, so that he could connect with others in a way that was life-giving. At three, he opened the third prescription, which read, re-examine your motives. And this is really the core prescription that drives us into our deep inner life. It is what the first two prescriptions get us to. So you can't start with the third. You've got to do the other two first. As we examine the questions of life that really matter. Like, what am I about, Really? What's my vision? What is my mission in life? What's my core? What is it that makes me tick? It's tough work because it is here that we see our true motives. And so as he did, the man on the beach began to observe a pattern as he was looking back. He realized, and as he was reevaluating, he realized that he had put at the center of himself, himself. He was selfish. Though his public life might have seemed like he was all about serving others, he was really about giving in order to receive recognition. He started to come to the awareness that his malaise and his depression was a disease of the spirit. His life was not centered on true contribution, but more about selfish motives and ambitions. And so even though this deep look within was hard, instead of groveling in condemnation and in self-pity, he spent much of the time of those three hours reorganizing, reorienting, replanting new motives and new desires that were congruent with the higher principles he claimed that he wanted. He started using his imagination instead of just living out of memory. Because when you focus only on your past, what happens? You get stuck there, don't you? But when you live out of your imagination, that creative space where the Holy Spirit of God is at work in your life, you focus on the future. Covey once said, what lies behind us is nothing compared to what lies within us and ahead of us. This is the process of deep inner work. Well, by then it was 6 p.m., The man was finished. He knew what his life was about, and he knew what it wasn't about. He knew what was the cause of his problem. He knew the direction he needed to take. And so he opened the last prescription, which said this. Write your troubles in the sand. Write your troubles in the sand. And so he took a shell, and he went to the high water mark, where he made a few markings on the sand, With the last sentences, as the tide was coming in to take them away. You know, this beautiful story reminds us that the beginning with the end in mind isn't something that comes easy or automatically to us. 
but rather is a calling that requires us to consider the cost, not just of time, but really getting in touch with ourselves and with God on a deep level. This is the path of discipleship. It's a lifelong journey that is not easy, but it is the key to life. Now, I have to share with you <laughs> that yesterday I tried to do some of that deep inner work. I wanted to be able to say I had tried this for myself. And so I went out on my deck. It was a beautiful day, y'all know. It was a beautiful day yesterday. So I went out on my deck, and I, I just kind of sat there listening. And, and while I had every intention of going for three hours doing this, it, in 15 minutes, monkey brain just went into effect, you know. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking about all these things. But... I didn't beat myself up about it. I didn't beat myself up about it. And I just acknowledged it was what it was. And so I continued to sit there. And I have to say, it was one of the most beautiful times. It wasn't all day, but it was a few, beautiful few hours where I got to experience the grace and the love of God for me. And it impacted the rest of my day and into today. Um. But, you know, giving ourselves grace in this, in this diving, um, we can't get it all done in one, probably one day. Um, but you see, the beginning and the end, with the end of mind has not only to do with taking a retreat and, and setting your life goals and getting clear about your mission and your vision and all of that stuff. I mean, goodness gracious, I've been taking six months to come up with uh, the next few years of our life together as Florence Christian Church, and our leadership will be hearing about that soon. But um, it's a process, folks. But here's the good thing. It's a daily practice for us as well to begin with the end in mind, to get up saying, good morning, Lord. Good morning. What are you and I going to be able to do today together? Here I am. Here I am. How can I be about your will and your way in my life this day? What do I want the end of this day to look like as I have lived it for you? How can you and I begin this day in, in, and begin with the end in mind so that rather, be, rather than being lived, that I can live? Let me count the cost, Lord Jesus. Let me count the cost of this day, of beginning with that end in mind. And the people of God said, amen and amen. At the first service, and I did this toward um, the invitation time, but I want to share this as we're thinking about communion today. Last weekend, I had a um, wonderful time at a family reunion and I don't get to see my sisters very often. And, you know, they were both there. We were sharing cabin together with Ron. Ron was the odd man out, but we had a really great time with him, too. And, um, and so uh, one of the things we always do when we have family reunion time together is with my sisters is that we think about our past. We think about our childhood. And, you know, some of those, of those things are painful, but a lot of them are fun. And we just kind of go back, you know, and we get, get kind of kind of uh, light together. So anyway, we're in the, we're in the Georgia mountains, North Georgia mountains, and um, we had uh, been walking through behind the cabin. We had been walking through the, uh, the woods there and came into this open area that was kind of up on a hill. And I said, let's go and run up, up the hill, you know. And so Ron got his camera, and he's out, you know, videotaping us. And, and here's these 60-year-old women running up the hill together. And we're just, and we're singing, the hills are alive with the sound of music. And we were just having the greatest time and laughing and waving our arms. And I thought, this is the craziest thing in the world. But it was wonderful. It was, a, it was a memory that we made that we will always cherish. And it was a sharing of our love that was joyful and free and loving and great. And, you know, when I think about communion, this table is a place of joy and life. You know, we focus a lot of times on death at this table, but it really is about life. 
And so as you come to this Eucharist, this time of thanksgiving, think about the ways in which God has been faithful to you. Think about the ways in which you can rejoice as you receive these symbols of God's love for you. Let's stand together as we prepare our hearts singing our song of praise. Mm -hmm. 